Our theme for today is living in the image and likeness of God, the struggle and the glory of that. And notice there's a, there's a, a bite at the end, the struggle and the glory. Usually, as we're going to see, when we think of the image and likeness of God, we think of this just this wonderful thing inside of us. Um, it's, it's not quite that simple. The first section, I want to talk simply about what that is and how we experience that theologically, spiritually, experientially, and so on. And then the second session, we want to talk about the struggle, that uh, this is not a simple thing at all, okay? And then the third session, guidelines about how do we live healthily with it. And I want to begin with kind of a, an entrance hymn. I want to read you two little pieces, and I'll refer to them later on, um, kind of a gathering hymn. The first one is a very famous piece, and it was in the inauguration speech of Nelson Mandela, but he never wrote this. It was written by a woman called Marian Williamson. You're familiar with this, but um, hang on to this because I'll come back to this. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us. You might ask yourself, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, the question is, who are you not to be? You are a child of God, and your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fears, that presence automatically liberates others. I'll come back on that. Now, the second one is from Michael Ondaatje. I think you recognize him. He's the man who wrote The English Patient. He's a Sri Lankan novelist now living in Canada. Um, and a brilliant, he's not just a novelist, he, he's, a, he's a theoretician on art. And, uh, and I'm not sure what Michael believes in, but he believes in, in energy. And um, he has this theory that if, because of the, the powerful energies inside of you, inside of us, if we aren't doing something creative, we'll be doing something destructive. So if we aren't creating something, we'll be violent. <coughs> So um, this is a passage from his book, Annals Ghost, where he's describing this artist who is refurbishing a statue of Buddha. And Andachi writes this way. He looked into the eyes of something that had once belonged to a god, and this is what he felt. As an artist, he could not celebrate the greatness of a faith. But he knew this. If he did not remain an artist, he would become a demon, because that is what war is. War has to do with demons and spectres of retaliation. Now, that's just a little bit of a flavor for image and likeness of God. Okay. I want to begin experientially. You know, when we say we have the image and likeness of God inside of us, we tend to picture that romantically, that somewhere inside of you there's stamped this beautiful icon of the Trinity <laughs> that may well be there. Uh, that's not the way you experience it. God, as we'll see, God is fire. God is energy. God is, is, is divine energy, and that's inside of us, and that's going to make everything that's great inside of us, and it's going to be the root of about 98% of our struggles. So I want to pick it up first experientially. How we, how we feel the image and likeness of God inside of us, how we experience that day to day. It begins this way. I call it our, our congenital discontent. Okay, and it's deep root. At the very center of our experience, in all of us, there lies a profound disquiet, a discontent, um, an appetitiveness, an appetite, uh, um, a, a non-silence. There's, there's an agitation. And, and this agitation, as I said, lies at the center, not at the edges. That's not a, a minute distinction. You know, it's like Henry Nouwen, the great spiritual writer, used to say. Henry Nouwen used to express this well. Nouwen says, you know, you aren't a restful person who occasionally gets restless. You're not a, you know, a satisfied person who occasionally gets dissatisfied. You're not a person who lives in habitual solitude and once in a while you experience agitation. It's the reverse. We are restless people who sometimes find rest. We are people who live in this quiet who sometimes find solitude. We're lonely people who sometimes find intimacy. 
Notice where the default lies. See, we're restless people and we sometimes find rest. So that uh, the restlessness, the disquiet, that's at the center of our experience, not at the edges. Now, that's experienced in, in countless ways. I just want to give you expressions of that just for, for flavor, but important because it helps, helps us to understand it. I wrote two books on this. So the, I, I originally wrote The Restless Heart. And when I did that, which was part of a, a thesis I wrote, and that was the popular book that came off it. But I just kind of re tried to research that in poets and authors and writers and philosophers and mystics and so on, how they would express that. And there's just so many countless wonderful expressions of that. The one I begin the holy longing with were from Plato. Plato says, we're fired into life with a madness that comes from the gods. It's quite an expression. We're fired into life with a madness that comes from the gods. And he said that madness has us believe that we can have a great love and that we can become immortal and that we can uh, contemplate God himself. Now, I want to look at that expression with you a little bit. First of all, I love the verb there. Notice what he says that we're fired into life. He doesn't say, you know, we're born serenely. You wake up in your crib, contemplatively survey your options, you know. No, you wake up crying, you know, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you're missing things and so on. He said, so, see, we're fired into life with a madness, but the madness comes from the gods. It's not human madness, it's divine madness. It's the image and likeness inside of us. What does he mean by that? Well, you know, Plato was a Stoic. And today we use the word Stoicism, and we use the word Stoic for somebody who, you know, they can endure suffering and with a, you know, they can tough it up and endure suffering. It comes from that, but the Stoics were a religious cult. And, and they were very close to Christianity. That's why Augustine, who was originally a Platonist, but could easily move into Christianity. In fact, what Augustine did is he simply took Christianity and Platonism and ran them through a blender. And, and what came out is what is Christian theology for the next 1,700 years, you know. But see, the Stoics, the Platonists, they, they, were, they were religious people. It was a religious cult, and they believed that our souls, they believed that our souls were little chips of divine fire that somehow came off the great you know, fire in the sky, and it would come down and get into bodies, but then your body would be restless and knocked all over the planet because you had this little chip of divine fire inside of you. You had a little god or goddess inside of you who would make it pretty difficult for you to ever be satisfied on this planet. Not a bad description at all. <laughs> you know? So you have a little chip of divine fire. The madness comes from the gods and makes you believe that, you know, you, you're more than an animal. It makes you believe, you know, you can have a great love. You can do something that's immortal. You can contemplate the divine that gives you great ambitions, great visions. It also gives you great problems, you know. See, cattle don't have that. I used to tell my anthropology students, you know the difference between humans and animals? Well, it's this. Cattle contentedly munch grass in pastures, and humans discontentedly smoke grass in bars. <laughs> okay. And the difference is cattle don't have that divine chip inside of them. Okay. See, divine fire. Well, the Greeks had another expression from which we get our word nostalgia, and they called it nostos. And, and the word nostos translates in English simply as homesickness. They said inside of the human being there's a deep homesickness and the problem is it doesn't go away even when you're at home. There's something inside of you, you're never quite in your true home. There's some longing, there's some nostalgia inside of you. Um, see, let's see, it's the image and likeness of God, divine madness, fire that comes from God. Now, you're familiar with some of the other classical expressions. St. Augustine in that, his wonderfully classic book, uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine. Remember how he begins that book. He says, you've made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That captures it. See, we're, we're made for something beyond this planet, image and likeness inside of us, and our hearts are going to be restless until they find that, until they find God. Or that famous passage you have in Scripture in the book of Koheleth, Ecclesiastes. And you're all familiar with that passage, very famous, the one about there's a season for everything. Remember how that goes? And he contrasts 14 opposites. And incidentally, the word kohela simply means the preacher. The preacher says, vanity of vanity, everything is vanity. Then he says, but there's a season for everything. 
Time to be born, time to die. Time to plant, and time to harvest. A time for war, time for peace. And he contrasts 14 opposites, but don't stop reading yet because it's the next line that is what he really wants to say. He contrasts these 14 opposites and he's contrasting the seasons. There's a season for everything. Then he says, God has made everything in its own time, its own season, but God has put timelessness into the human heart so that the human being is out of sync with the seasons from beginning to end. Notice what he's saying. See, nature, cattle, the weather, everything has this rhythm, has this season, and so on. And it goes spring, summer, winter, fall. Young calves are born and they become cattle and they have baby calves and this beautiful cycle goes on except you haven't fit into that from the first day. From the day you were born, you're out of sync with the seasons because the seasons, it's a beautiful poetic image, the seasons are, are set to the rhythm of time. But you have timelessness inside of you and that puts you out of sync with time from beginning to end. So you never quite fit into time. It's a wonderful expression. You have timelessness, eternity, they sometimes uh, translate inside of you. What is this timelessness? What is this eternity? See, well, it's the image and likeness of God. That's the divine fire inside of us. I want to read you a passage from the diary of Anne Frank. This is the 12-year-old girl. Um, let me just read this passage and then ask you, what is, what is she longing for? This is a, a passage from her diary. She says, Today the sun is shining. The sky is a deep blue. There's a lovely breeze and I am longing. I am so longing for everything. To talk, for freedom, for friends, to be alone, to be with others. And I do so long to cry. I feel as if I'm going to burst. I know it would get better with crying, but I can't. I'm restless. I go from room to room. I breathe through a crack in a closed window and feel my heart beating as if it's saying, can't you satisfy my longing at last? I believe that it is springtime within me. I feel that spring is awakening. I feel it in my whole body and soul. It's an effort to behave normally. I am utterly confused. I don't know what to read, what to write, what to do. I only know that I am longing. What's she longing for? Everything. Notice she wants to be with people, she wants to be alone. She wants to be outside, she wants to be inside, um, and on and on. Now, Thomas Aquinas, the great philosopher, and I remember reading that as a, as a philosophy student when I was 19 years old and getting it, <laughs> getting it to a point where I thought, he's introducing me to me. Very philosophical. Thomas Aquinas said, what would be the adequate object of the intellect and the will? That's pretty philosophical and abstract. You know. But basically what that means in English means, what would ever make you satisfied? What would you have to know and experience for you to, to be satisfied? And Thomas says, all being. So basically, see, everything. See, you'd have to be everywhere, drinking in everything, knowing everything, embracing everything, basically making love to the whole world, then you'd be kind of satisfied. See, what, what, what do you want? You want everything. Let's just describe it with Anne Frank. I mean, see, we're going to see that's the energy, that's godly energy. That's not a bad energy. You know, sometimes with kids, when the parents say, Well, why can't you sit still? And so on, they say, It's not my fault, it's God's <laughs> fault. <laughs> Remember Pascal, Blaise Pascal, the famous philosopher, says, All the miseries of the human being come from the fact that nobody can sit still in a room for one hour. Uh, there's a lot in that. All the miseries of the planet come from the fact that nobody can sit still in a room for one hour. Those of you with young kids, you know exactly what, what that means. Okay, energy, that energy inside of us. It's not bad energy, it's powerful energy. You know who Doris Lessing is? She just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. She's in her late 80s now. Incidentally, they said when she won the prize for literature, the press showed up at her house. She didn't know that. She was out in her garden doing some gardening and they came all excited with television cameras. And they said, you've won the Nobel Prize. And she said, I couldn't care less. <laughs> okay. But anyway, the great novelist, one of our great novelists of the last century, and, uh, and, and never worked out of any kind of faith stance, but really was able to, to, to have different ways of naming this. Have you ever read her famous, probably her most famous book called The Golden Notebook? And her hero in there, Anna, who's just kind of knocked all over the planet, but 
she simply calls it the 10,000 volts that are inside of us. So we have this energy, she just calls it, we have 10,000 volts of energy. What's it for? It's for everything. For love, for hatred, for sex, for altruism, for whatever. You just have this powerful energy inside of you that, that just drives you all over the planet. Albert Camus, the great philosopher, who also won the Nobel Prize, and, and Camus was an atheist, but in his books he'd have different images for this. And, and one of his images was this. He says he was trying to explain the human spirit. He said, you know how we're in the world? And he used this image. He used the image of a medieval prison. In medieval prisons, what they do to try to break a person's spirit, they would put the person in a prison, you know, literally a box that was too small for him or her. So imagine if the guy's six feet tall, they'd put him into a five foot room so he could never stand straight and five feet long so he could never stretch out. And the idea was, by never being able to stretch to his full height, it would eventually break his spirit. And Camus said that's exactly the way we're in the world. We're here and we can never stretch out. You can never attain your full height. You can never really stretch on this planet. You're basically overcharged, overbuilt, overmade for the planet. And uh, it eventually breaks your spirit. Eventually leads us into a lot of depression, as you're gonna see when we look at the second hour. One of the great struggles with the image and likeness of God, it leads to a lot of depression. Um, it's no accident there's just a lot of depression on this planet. Because um, when you have six billion people and they all have a little god or goddess inside of them, uh, it's a formula for a lot of problems. And, and when you have a god or goddess inside of you and we're living ordinary lives where we can't really stretch out, that's also a formula for a lot of depression. Hinduism, or in world religions, they also have that. In Hinduism, they have a beautiful expression, they call it nostalgia for the infinite. That there's a, there, there's a certain homesickness inside of us, they don't explain why or where it comes from, we simply have this nostalgia for infinity. That there's something inside of humanity that isn't satisfied with humanity. Those of you who have read Shakespeare, remember Shakespeare, his famous line, we, we live with these immortal longings, that there's a, like a nostalgia for the infinite. We're, we're always longing for something that has to do beyond this planet. Now, that's just simply expressions of how we feel it. You probably have your own formula, or how, how do you feel uh, restlessness or the inadequacy of your life to measure up to who you are? See, our lives are always inadequate to your spirit and to what's inside of you. And so uh, they're, they're always too limited. Karl Rahner, and I love this expression. It's convoluted, as only a German theologian can put it, but it's brilliant. Okay. And Karl Rahner once said, in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable, you ultimately learn that here in this world, there is no finished symphony. It's a great expression. He says, in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable, you ultimately learn that here in this life, there is no finished symphony. See, we get beauty, we get love, we get satisfaction, but, but never without a shadow. There is, you, you never get the complete symphony. Remember Henry Nouwen had some classical expressions for that. Henry Nouwen once said, he says, in this life, there's no such a thing as a clear cut, pure joy. That's quite a statement. Believe that? He said, in this life, there's no such thing as a clear cut, pure joy. He said, but in everything, there's a shadow, you know? You're at a beautiful place on vacation, but you miss the person who can't be there. In all friendship, there's some distance. In all success, there's a fear of jealousy. You know, in every uh, family or something, there are some tensions. See, we have it, but we don't. We, we have joys in this life, but it's never clear cut, pure joy. There's always in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable we ultimately realize in this life there's such a thing as a clear cut pure joy. And the reason is not because there's something wrong with us or not because there's something wrong with life. The reason is you're going to see is because we're made in God's image and likeness and we're divine literally there's divinity inside of us which is infinite which is trying to work its way out in a finite world. Uh, that's always going to be a formula for a certain dissatisfaction. Now, just to, to, to highlight the last two points of this, then, we'll, then I want to move into Scripture and look at what it means to be in God's image and likeness. 
the characteristics of this, and that is that there's always an insatiability in our life. So, you know, you may have some rare moments of ecstasy or some kind of ecstatic uh, satisfaction where for a few minutes you feel, no, I'm there, um, but it won't last. We're, there's always, we're, we're looking, we're waiting. In fact, Henry Nouwen once said too, he says, you know, we spend about 98% of our lives waiting for something else to happen to us. <laughs> it's really true. See, you're in one moment, but you're not really in it. So that... Uh, you're at a train station or, and you're waiting to pick up somebody and so you're waiting for them to come. You're going at the airport, you're waiting to board the plane. Um, you're in a conference, you're waiting for it to end, to get to the coffee break. You know, those are in small things, but it's also true for the bigger things in our lives. You know, the student can't wait to graduate and after they graduate they can't wait to get married and start their own family and get their job and then they can't wait to have the kids and they can't wait for the kids to leave <laughs> and, and see and you can't wait until you have to wait till your health clears up or this happens or that happens or your husband gets a promotion or you get a promotion or you get a new job see we're always in one moment but we're waiting for something else to happen we spend about 98 percent of our lives in one woman moment waiting for another moment to come um, so we have all these theologies and spiritualities and today kind of self-help books on trying to be in the present moment. Good luck. It's not that easy. Um, we're meant to be in the present moment, but it's not that easy to do because we're so charged and the present moment is finite and there's parts of us that are infinite and they're going to find it difficult to, to, to ground in the present moment. So there's, there's a perpetual disquiet and insatiability. I like Plato's expression. He calls it, there's a divine madness inside of us. And the madness comes from the gods. The madness actually is the image and likeness of God inside of us. And one last thing before I go into scripture with this, and that is very important, that is not something against the spirit or against spirituality inside of us. And too often I think in the churches we've made that mistake. We've run away from this. We've, we've, we've typed it as bad, whatever, and we've seen it as something that goes against spirituality when in fact it's the root of spirituality. This is the root. This is the holy longing. This is the root of your spirit. It's not, you know, your spirit doesn't get restless. Restlessness is your spirit. Carl Rahner used to say, you're not a spirit who gets lonely. Loneliness is your soul. Your soul is a hunger created, created for God. You know, the great mystics, they got this. How does John of the Cross, the great mystic, how does it be in all his great works, this great poem? One dark night, fired by love's urgent longings, what drives you out towards God? The urgent longings, the fire inside of you. That's the God inside of you going back to the God in heaven. So that is, it, it's the essence of our spirit. Now, we're going to see, this, especially the second hour, there are lots of problems with that. That is going to create enough problems for you to write two books on abnormal psychology. Um, but, but it's also, it's our greatness, it's everything. It's, it's, it's the god or goddess inside of you. Now, let's root that. Let's go into scripture. When we, when scripture describes the creation of the human being, it makes it very clear, you know, so that the creation story, as you know, happens the first five days. Um, it works by God's word and it kind of works on uh, more or less automatically, you know. The beginning was the formless void, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Then God said, let the land and water separate, and they separated, and so on. And so it goes on till all of creation is done except the human being. And then it's, it's written, there's really a full stop. So that what happened now is not going to be the same thing as what happens when the man and woman are created. So there's a full stop, and then the sixth day, and there's two accounts of that of God creating the man and the woman and breathing into them the breath of God, the Ruah of Yahweh, and then the man and woman um, come to birth. But before that, there's a full stop and God says, let us make the man, Adam, which isn't actually a, a masculine. That means the earth creature, except you, <laughs> we couldn't translate it like that in our Bibles. It would sound like something from Star Wars. Let us make the earth creature in our image and likeness. But he says, let us make the earth creature, which that's both the man and the woman, in our image and likeness, okay, 
Notice we're made in God's image and likeness. Okay? And what, why, for incidentally, why the word our? Sometimes people read the Trinity into that. You know, God is speaking plural. No. I mean, God's Trinity, but that's not what this means. That, that is what scholars call the majestic plural. Uh, kings and queens speak in that. That's just going to come back. Kings and We are a king. We are a queen. If you ever listen to Queen Elizabeth give the speech from the throne, she doesn't say I. It's just we say this. We say this. See that the majestic plural. Kings and queens speak in the plural because they're speaking for everybody. When I was a seminary once, once we had a retreat director, and he did this. He spoke in a majestic plural. He says, we will do this, and we will do that. And he got up to walk out of the room one day, and one of the seminarians said, there they go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But God says, let us make the earth creature, the man and the woman, in our image and likeness, to have dominion over it. The birds, the sea, the fish, everything, they will store it, the planet. Now, what does that mean? We're made in God's image and likeness. Now, two Hebrew words there, and actually they're, they're technical terms. In Hebrew, because that text is written in Hebrew, image and likeness are the words Salem and Demut. Salem is image, Demut is likeness. Okay, But it was a technical term that was used at the time for kings and queens. And it was in this sense. The Salem referred to literally to a statue. So that, um, and we still have that. You know, oftentimes rulers put up a statue of themselves in central places. When the Americans took Baghdad, remember they, they tore down the statue of Saddam Hussein. That was the Salem. See, so kings or rulers put up statues to remind people that I'm the ruler here. So that's the first thing, see. We are in God's image and likeness. We're, we're, we represent him or God in ruling. And the likeness was actually a person. The likeness was a representative. So that, for instance, Pontius Pilate was the representative for Caesar. So take Julius Caesar. He lived in Rome, but he ruled in Palestine. He couldn't be there. So what he would do is he would set up an image and likeness for himself in Palestine, a statue in all the market squares, Central Market Squares, you'd have a, a statue of Julius Caesar reminding people, even though he isn't here, he's our ruler. And then he would set a prime minister, Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate ruled in his place. He ruled in the place of Caesar. Now, put those two together and go back to Scripture. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness, in our Salem and Demut. So God is saying, to, and, and notice, to rule over the planet. We are here as God's special creature to um, rule over creation, and we represent God. And in that sense, hang on to the expressions, we are God's kings and we are God's queens. See, the king or queen rules. And that is why you're going to see in the Old Testament, you know who got this? And he's the only person who got it in the Old Testament, was David. And David is going to be the anthropological figure in the Old Testament. It's not Moses. Moses is the prophetic figure. David is going to be the anthropological figure. And who is Jesus going to connect himself to? Moses, the prophets, or David? David. He's going to be the son of David. David is going to get what it means to be image and likeness. The image and likeness radiates, notice, let us make him, in our image and likeness, male and female, so that both maleness and femaleness equally image God. I'm not saying something that's wildly liberal here or wildly out of line. That's just flat out straight scripture. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness, male and female, so that God isn't a male and God isn't a female and God isn't neutered either without gender. God is masculine and feminine. And it's actually what God is, is masculinity and femininity perfectly working together. That's why God is so fertile, you know, universes and just keep spinning off of God. So that, you know, th the best image, and I don't mean this in, a, in, a, in any kind of a trite sense at all or light sense. If you want one of the, the best images of what's happening inside of God is this. You have perfect masculinity and perfect femininity making perfect love. That's, the, that's why God is love, you know, and, and everything, the two genders. We, we, we come out of God, and we both image 
God. And we both image God equally, male and female. Iliadi, the great anthropologist, used to say, if you want to picture archetypally God, he says, picture at the center of the universe two thrones. On one sits a king, on one sits a queen. Together they rule the universe. That's God. Except they're both inside of one person. King, queen. Incidentally, that is why in all great stories, and all great fairy tales, how do they have to end? They have to end with a marriage. All great fairy tales, remember they end with a marriage to prince and princess. They meet and they marry and they live happily ever after. Because they're describing the inside of God. <laughs> and the inside of God, marriage takes place. Inside of Christ, the, the central parables of the kingdom have to do with what? Always a marriage. The kingdom of heaven is like a marriage feast because there's a marriage inside of God. And see, male and female, we both, both sides image that. Now, and it gives us status. See, what that does, it makes you the prime minister. You're God's Pontius Pilate. You're God's prime minister on this planet. And that brings with an immense responsibility. You're meant to be this person who's taking care of the planet, um, not, you know, abusing the planet. Precisely, you're the gardener, you're the steward, taking care of the planet in God's place. We represent God on the planet. Now, who got that? I want to give you two figures from Scripture who got it the clearest, and they're, they're, they're set up as we're supposed to imitate them, David and Jesus, okay? David is the Old Testament figure of anthropology. David gets what it means to be in, your own, in God's image and likeness, and Jesus is going to get it in the New Testament and radiate it to us perfectly. But David first does it in the Old Testament. He's the kingly figure. Notice Moses, Isaiah, they're prophets. They're wonderful, but they're not kingly figures. They're prophets. David's the king, okay? And he's really clear. He's the king, okay? Now, what David gets and the others don't get and that is, as God's king, as God's image and likeness on this planet, you have all this responsibility. He rules, rules the kingdom. But you also, what that does is it gives you a different relationship to God. So that your relationship to the God is not that of a worm or, or a slave to a master. Your relationship to God is that of a prime minister to a king. Okay? Let me give you examples of that. I'm going to give you two powerful examples, both in 2 Samuel. One of how David, because of that, he, he can store it life and make a decision completely free of fear, and yet it's a wise decision. And Jesus, later on in the New Testament, is going to ratify that. And it's this. They say one day, David and his men were at war, and they were coming back from the battle, and they were hungry. And they came to the temple in the morning. They had not eaten all night. And in the temple there was consecrated bread that only the priests were allowed to eat normally. Okay? David goes to the high priest and he said, I want the bread for the soldiers. And the high priest said, you can't have it. This is consecrated bread meant to be eaten in ritual assembly by the priests. And David said, I know that, but I'm God's king and the men are hungry and today we're going to take the bread. And I suspect he told the priest, if you don't like it, you'll be looking for other work. Uh, now, this wasn't an arrogant thing. Actually, later on, Jesus is going to say David did a good thing. So he was seen as a good thing. Why? See, David is God's king on earth. And David is making decisions. Saying, you know, if God were here, he's not going to let people starve over some rubric. You know, that's the, the, the great Christian principle, the Jewish principle of epikaya. You know, it's not the law. It's the intent of the lawgiver. And that's going to be adjudicated. And David says, I'm the king, and I'm trying to act responsibly here. I'm acting in God's place, and he did a good thing. See, John Shea once wrote a great one-line commentary on that. He says, you know, you know what David realized there? He said, David realized that God isn't the law to be obeyed. God is a creative presence of love and creativity that you seize and act under. See, God isn't the law to be obeyed. God is a presence you live under and you act under, and you act under responsibly. Remember Thomas More, one great line from Thomas More? He said, God made animals and plants and nature to serve him in the simplicity of their natures. But he made the human being with intelligence. He made you to serve him in 
the uncanny and complex recesses of your mind. That's good. That's good spirituality. You aren't simple, and it isn't simple. God doesn't want you to be a robot. God wants you to be a king or a queen who acts with responsibility for the planet, not just for yourself, for everybody. And David did it. Those are lines that you're supposed to be imitating. I'm the king, I'm the queen, and God ex expects me to not be a robot here. God expects me to act responsibly with the intelligence and stuff that God has given me. See, David got it. They were scandalized, but remember later on, Jesus is going to say, remember about David and the loaves? He said, David did a good thing because he realized we weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. Jesus is going to ratify this. Isn't it? No, learn from David. God doesn't want robots. That's why you have in animals and plants. You know, God made you with intelligence, with, with firepower to be a king or a queen. God wants responsible, creative action from you. See, David got it. I'll give you another example from David. And that was how he handled his son's death. When his son was dying, his illegitimate son, he, he heard the son was dying, so they said, David did what a man, a father should do in a situation like that. He put on sackcloth and ashes. He went on a fast. See, there was a whole ritual they would do. If, if one of your children was sick and dying, you would take off good clothes, you'd put on sackcloth, which was you know, a symbol both of penitence but also of prayer. You'd put ashes on your head, and then you'd go on a fast. You wouldn't eat, you wouldn't drink wine, and, you, and you, you'd abstain from sexuality. So there was a whole kind of fast you went on. So, and, and you prayed. So David went on this fast. Abstinence, fasting, sackcloth, ashes. And while he's sitting and doing this, they bring him word that his son died. And then David scandalized them. They said he got up and he took off the sackcloth and the ashes. He bathed and he, he perfumed his body. And then he went out and he had a meal and he drank wine, which is a festive drink. And then he went immediately and he slept with his wife and she conceived, and nine months later gave birth to Solomon. But the people were scandalized. They came to David and they said, um, we don't understand this. When your child was dying, you fasted and you prayed, and now he's dead, and you dine, and you do this other stuff. And David said, when my child was dying, I prayed whether God, so that God might save him. But God didn't. He said, but now he's dead. And I can't go to him, and he can't come to me. But now, life will go on in a new way. See, David had discerned that the issues of life are not in any kind of fear before death. You know, his idea was, I can let life go, um, and God will give new life, and we move on. <coughs> See, you don't cling in, in um, give you an image of that. You know, the, the early Egyptians, they used to mummify their bodies and we still have some, you know, famous Egyptian mummies. They would, you know, store bodies in formaldehyde and keep them for centuries. Why don't Christians do that? Because you don't keep a dead body. See, David says, you let a dead body, it, it becomes fertilizer for apple trees. God gives you something new. So that, that, ki that child is dead, and I loved him, and I fasted and prayed till the second he died. But now I'm going to move on. Now. Today we'd say he needs some grieving and stuff in between. Now they didn't they just truncate those stories, but see, David got it. Scripture says he got it. He understood it. The king, the image and likeness of God, the, the, the child, the creature of the earth, doesn't fear death, doesn't fear life, doesn't fear God. They move with a freedom and a responsibility as kings and queens move. See, that, that's us. You're the king, you're the queen. Don't be afraid of God. Don't be afraid of life. Don't be afraid of death. You don't have to be. Um, you're in the image and likeness of God. You walk on this, this planet as a god, as a goddess, which doesn't mean we do it with arrogance and so on. And in fact, sometimes we do notice now David didn't do it perfectly. He had some massive moral falls. And the interesting thing is he was able to redeem himself from them. He didn't hang himself after, as Judas did. Judas had a major moral fall. What did he do? He hung himself afterwards. David had a major moral fall. What did he do? He repented and he prayed and he came out afterwards and wrote the Psalms. You know, there's a way to come back that God's 
chosen one, God's blessed one, the image and likeness. What do you do after you, you fall? What do you do when your image and likeness of God makes you arrogant and makes you take the earth as your possession, which is wrong? There's a way to come back from that. David understood it. So he's our model, both in terms of how you do it right and what do you do when you do it wrong. Okay, now, Jesus comes along and Jesus presents himself very clearly. He is the son of David. Notice he doesn't say I'm the son of Moses. He comes from the house of David. He's the son of David, which is, you know, could be true, you know, in terms of his lineage and genetics and so on. But that's not so much the major point scripture is making. They're not so much that he's the son of David that genetically he's linked to David. The, the real meaning of that is it's deeper. He's linked to David in terms of David was God's chosen one in the Old Testament. Jesus is God's chosen one in the New Testament. Okay. And then Jesus uses the image of he's God's, Scripture talks about Jesus as God's blessed one. He is the blessed one, okay? Um, now, I want to I use the, the one, one central image for that, and that's Jesus at his baptism. In, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three synoptic gospels, the baptism is described almost identical in each gospel, and it's a beautiful text, you know? They say, Jesus went to John at the Jordan to be baptized. And actually, it's a bit of a scandalous text because to go to John to be baptized was to admit that you were a sinner. Now, Jesus wasn't a sinner. So for him going to be, let himself be baptized by John, there was a little bit of a, a tension for his disciples. Like, why would he do that? See, to John was a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus goes to be baptized. It's like today, if somebody goes to confession, obviously they have something to confess. You know? So the people were a little bit shocked by that, you know. Um, he went to be baptized for sin when in fact he wasn't a sinner. Okay, but he goes to be baptized by John. Then this beautiful text, they see John immersed Jesus in the Jordan. And when his head came out of the Jordan, the heavens opened, and the voice from heaven said, This is my blessed one in whom I take delight. Uh, now, to understand the consciousness of Jesus, we got to get this. Okay, so that... Um, Scholars will tell you that to understand the way Jesus views the world and sees the world and blesses the world, it only makes sense on the basis, and see that was all like Jesus' ordination, that's at the beginning of his, his ministry. Prior to that, Jesus was a carpenter and he was living a private life. He gets baptized and that kind of puts him onto the world stage as a, as a, as a person healing and preaching and so on. But then it also sets the whole tone and consciousness and vision for his preaching. Because Jesus will go out and he'll say, you know, blessed are you when you're poor, and blessed are you when you're meek, and blessed are you when you're suffering. Those are stunning statements. How it can be you're blessed when you're poor and suffering and dying. But it's this. See, Jesus, you have to imagine, okay, when he was baptized, he heard his father say, you are my blessed one, and you I take delight. Okay, now, that sets his eyesight. It's as if during his whole life, he's hearing this in his ear, you know, on, you know, that's an image. Jesus hearing his ear, his father saying, you're my blessed one. So when he looks out, that's what he sees. You're blessed, you're blessed, blessed are you. <coughs> one of the problems is most of us have been cursed. And when we look out, we don't see blessing at all. We say, the world's rotten. This guy's selfish, this guy's greedy, she's full of herself, and so on. See, these are all little curses. Why? Because that's what we're hearing. Some say, you're full of yourself, you're too good for your own good, who the hell do you think you are, and so on. Then we look out, that's exactly what we see. You know, in every great religion, and in all philosophies, they have the axiom, they said, you don't really see what's out there. We project out, and we just color everything out there. So that, um, remember the old axiom in philosophy, whatever is received is received according to the mode of the receiver which means when we look out there, we're, we're seeing according to our own filters. And so if I've been kicked around a lot, and people say, you know, you're selfish and you're an idiot and you're this and so on, I'm going to be seeing a lot of selfish, idiotic people out there. <laughs> the same with you know, vice versa. Jesus hears, you're my blessed one. He looks out and he sees the world is blessed. Blessed when you're poor. That's why Jesus can bless the planet. Um, you know, the, the Buddhists have a wonderful little story on this. And, little parable they teach this say you don't see what's out there 
you see what's inside of yourself and you project it out. So this is the little parable. They said one day was a Buddha and he was sitting under a tree, fat. You know, the Buddha is always a fat person. And uh, so this young trim soldier walks by, looks at the Buddha and he says, you look like a pig. And the Buddha looked up at him calmly and said, and you look like God. And the soldier said, now why would you say I look like God? The Buddha said, well, you know, you don't see what's out there. We see what's inside of ourselves and project it out. And I sit all day and I think about God. And when I look out, that's what I see. And you must be thinking of other things. <laughs> okay. So I'm glad you got that. See, if I'm looking at the world, everybody's selfish. The world's rotten. This guy's a jerk. She's selfish. He's full of himself. That's saying a lot about me, not a lot about the world out there. See, Jesus could look out the blessed one. It's going to be really key. See, the blessed one sees, you, you felt your blessing. You're God's special creature. You're the one set above creation. You're the God. You're the goddess. You're King David. You're Jesus. And when you look out, God blessed you. God is saying over you, you're my beloved one in whom I take delight. You're my blessed creature. See, then that's the way we have to see the world. You know, in Luke's gospel, this is the clearest, and it's wonderful in Luke's gospel, in Luke's Gospel, the, the temptations of Jesus are set right after this. And they're directly linked to temptations against his blessedness. I want to I do this with you because these are the great temptations against our image and likeness of God. So Luke said immediately after Jesus was baptized, he came out of the waters, the heavens opened, said, You are my blessed one in whom I take delight. They said, Then the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now notice it wasn't Satan who drove Jesus out in the wilderness, the Spirit did. He was driven out into the wilderness by the Spirit, and there he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then Luke said, afterwards he was hungry. Well, well he should be. You know, <laughs> guy hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. But Luke, that isn't a throwaway line. That means he was hungry in a deeper way. Hang on to this word hungry. He was empty. Okay. And then because he's empty, then he was vulnerable. See, now the devil can strike because he's empty. See, the devil can get you when you're hungry. And what's he hungry for? Okay. These are the three temptations. So then the devil comes up to him and the devil says to him, if you are the blessed one, okay, if you're the, the child of God, notice, if you've got the image and likeness of God inside of you, he says, then turn these stones into bread so that you can eat. Um, Notice, you're God's child. You believe you're God's king or queen, goddess on the planet. How come you're so hungry? How come you have all these hungers inside of you? Turn the stones into bread so you can eat. And Jesus says, you don't live by bread alone. Basically, this is what the temptation is. The devil is saying to Jesus, if you think you're God's special creature on this planet, how come your life is so empty? You know, see, that's our perennial temptation. All of us in this room, we believe we're God's special creature, but a lot of times our lives can seem real empty, you know. And Jesus says, you don't live by bread alone. Basically, Jesus' answer is, you know, I can be empty and I'm still God's blessed one. You know, being God's blessed one doesn't depend who has the most, who has the most money, who has the most friends, who has the most of anything, you know, who has the most fame, who has, the, you know, see. But that's the perennial temptation. That's the temptation against our blessedness. If you believe you're God's blessed one, I'm telling you this morning, you know, you're God's goddess. You have a god, a goddess inside of you. You're God's king, you're God's queen. Well, how come our lives are so empty? You know, and see, then we feel the temptation precisely when we're empty. See, he was hungry, and so that's why the devil could strike. And Jesus says, I can be empty, and I'm still God's blessed one. Then the devil does a second temptation, said, he shows him all the kingdoms of the earth, the glories of these kingdoms, and he said, I'll give you all this glory if you'll fall down and worship me. Second temptation. Jesus is hungry, okay? And he's empty of what? Well, he's empty of many things. The second one, he's empty of fame and recognition. See, the kingdoms, glory has to do with fame and recognition. Who has been on Oprah recently? Who, you know, who, who has won an Academy Award? whose name is in lights. Basically, the devil is saying to Jesus, you believe you're God's special one? How come you're a big, fat nobody? You know, nobody knows your name. You know, you're not famous. Um, and Jesus' answer is, I can be God's 
chosen one. I can be God's blessed one. I'm God's image and likeness. And I can be a nobody. Um, being God's blessed one doesn't depend on fame and who won the Super Bowl and who won an Oscar and who's been on Oprah and who's been on David Letterman and who's, to, you know, who's been in People magazine lately. You know, you know it's, it's unfortunate, and, and I want to emphasize this one. Today, we struggle a lot with that. We struggle a lot with that. You know, uh, to give you just kind of a crass example, when I was a kid, and I wasn't that long ago, and not that we were perfect, but you know, remember we used to be schooled on lives of the saints? We'd, we'd read the lives of the saints. You know what's replaced the lives of the saints? People magazine. We don't read the lives of the saints. Today we read People magazine. Who are our new saints? Angelina Jolie, you know, uh, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, and on and on. It's not that those are bad people, but notice, we, we identify unconsciously sanctity with fame and fortune and, and, you know, that kind of glamour. Those are our new lives of the saints. Who are your kids? You know, they're not reading, you know. We just celebrate the feast of Saint Maria Goretti. They don't read her life, you know. They're reading about Angelia Jolie and Julie Roberts and, you know, Brad Pitt and, you know, whose marriage is broken up. Those are, those are our new saints. And like I said, again, not that they're bad people. It's simply, that's, there's been a whole shift. And, and see, they're the new gods and goddesses that we project this on. And that's a temptation. That's exactly what the second temptation of Jesus is. If you, are, you believe you're God's image and likeness, how come you don't look like George Clooney? Or you, you don't look like Angelina Jolie, and you haven't been on Oprah, and you are not on People magazine, and so on. Jesus said it's nothing to do with that. That's not what image and likeness is about. And then we get to the last temptation, which I like. They said, then the devil took him up to the parapet of the temple, the very peak of the temple, and he told him, if you're the son of God, then throw yourself down and make God catch you. Because it is written in scripture, and that's where you get the expression from, even the devil can quote scripture. Mm -hmm. And he's going to quote Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 says, um, the, the, the loved one, the blessed one, will not dash his foot against a stone. So he said, put God to the test. Throw yourself down and see whether God catches you. If you're God's blessed one, it's promised in the Psalms that you won't hit your foot against a stone. So test God. I like the answer. There was an old uh, Dominican uh, generation ago, Gerald Van, and uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote many books, but on this particular one, and I like the answer. He said, you know, when, when the devil says to Jesus, throw yourself off the temple and make God catch you, you know what Jesus tells the devil? He said, I'll take the stairs down the way the ordinary people do. <laughs> you know, why should I have a VIP elevator? See, what, what the devil, again, he's appealing to Jesus, if you're God's special one, you're God's blessed one. You should have VIP privileges. There should be a glass elevator. Jesus has left the building, you know. You know, you shouldn't be riding the buses when you're 45 years old, you know. You should be riding business class, not coach. Um, see, Jesus says, I'll take the stairs to what the ordinary people do. See that, again, our blessedness has nothing to do with who has privileges, who, who is famous, whose life seems to be full, who's on People magazine, and who writes business class, and so on. Um, that's not have to do with our blessedness. That's why Jesus says, you're blessed no matter what. You're blessed when you're poor. You're blessed when you're meek. You're blessed when you're riding the bus. You're blessed when you don't have your own car. You're blessed when you, you're a big, fat nobody living in rural Kansas. Think on somebody, you know. Um, see, that's nothing to do with that. Now. That's, that's the, the, the basic identity, so that we are born and we have this powerful, powerful energy inside of us. We are born and, and you are born and, you're, and that's the deepest part of you. That's why it's your center. You're in the image and likeness of God. You have inside of you this divine chip, this powerful piece of divine fire, which is going to make you a great person. I mean, that's your greatness. It sets you above the animals, it sets you above everything else, but as you're going to see it, it also is the source of mammoth problems for us because you have all this firepower and it's the source of these temptations. Why am I not famous? Why am I still riding the buses? And why am I a nobody? And so on, if I'm God's image and likeness. You know, it's hard to believe we're special some days when we look in the mirror and we don't look that special. You know, and we look at our lives and they're not that special. 
and yet we are the blessed one. We're the blessed one. So it's going to be the source of our, of all that's good in us. It's also going to be the, a major source of our temptations, of the, the struggles we have in life, and so on. Um, and that's what we'll look at the second hour.